Welcome everybody to today's live stream of the Nationwide Prayer Campaign to End Abortion Forever. Thank you for persevering with us and we have uh, Joe Arpaio today to speak on pro-life. Let us start praying. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. We got disconnected with them. We're going to have to do this through phone um, uh, with Joe Arpeo. And um, I will just introduce you to him. Um, Sheriff Joe Michael Arpeo is an American former law enforcement officer and politician. He served as the 36th sheriff of... Hello? Manicopa County. I'm introducing you. <laughs> um, yes, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, hold on a second. Yes, yes, I'm just introducing you now. Okay. Yes, Zoom is not working. It's not operating. Yes, I wish it could. Okay, hang on, hang on. Um, I'm so sorry. Starting in 2005, Arpeo took an outspoken stance against illegal immigration, styling himself as America's toughest sheriff. Um, he has been accused of numerous police conduct, but the truth will come out. The truth will come out. Uh, he has been Maricopa County Sheriff for from 1992 to 2016, the longest running Republican County Sheriff in Arizona and um, let me introduce him to you hi Sheriff Joe sorry we got Hello. disconnected this is crazy uh, yeah how you doing um wait wait you're Sheriff. coming in it looks like you're getting admitted hold on one second so um thank you for coming in thank you so much so are we okay live I'm trying to get you there but in the meantime uh, uh, in the meantime, somehow it's it's just not working, you know. Yeah, the telephone isn't working either. No, the you're you're being heard right now. Oh, okay. So people are listening to yes. me now. Yes. Say hello oh, to okay. everybody. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. You listen to me. This is Sheriff Joe Arpaio uh, from Arizona, and thank you, Karen, for inviting me on a very important subject matter. Yes. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. So, um, one reason I agreed to do the interview, not that I turn down anybody, but you're very important. You have a very good issue, the right to life. And, uh, you know, you probably don't know, uh, that I'm a big right to life guy and I have a personal reason for that. We'd love um, to hear your story. Uh, well, first of all, I was born uh, Flag Day, June 14, 1932, so you know I'm a senior citizen. Yes. And I've been uh, sheriff uh, for 24 years, longest in history of Maricopa County. But before that, I uh, joined the Army when the Korean War broke out, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, I love New Jersey. I used to go down there to Patterson, Passaic, on, on leave. Uh, and then uh, went overseas, came back, Washington, D.C. cop, Las Vegas cop, Bureau of Narcotics, known as DEA, uh, for 26 uh, years, retired, joined my wife in travel business, and then decided to run for sheriff in 1993 when I was 60 years old. So I hope a lot of senior citizens are listening lasted 24 years with all the turmoil constitution uh, problems and everybody after me because i was just doing my job but my faith kept me going now I'll go back to when i was born uh, unfortunately uh, my mother and father both came here from italy and my mother had a medical problem and she refused uh, a uh, abortion 
and she gave her life for me. So, uh, you know, other than my Catholic uh, religion, that also uh, stuck with me uh, during my life. And uh, my daughter and her husband uh, adopted four uh, babies born at the, when they were in the households. She adopted through the Catholic services. So I have four grandchildren that I never would have had if the mothers went through abortion. And I'm not going to get into the history of all the mothers. Uh, but uh, one, one grandkid is uh, Mexican with Down syndrome. The other one is black. Uh, so, you know, if I don't publicize that. They call me a racist constantly the whole world because I was just uh, doing my job. Uh, but that's okay. So uh, I did write a book. It's going to come out on October 20. And in that book, I talk about my mother and I talk about my upbringing and of course, I talk about my career and 55 years of law enforcement, especially what's going on now that I've been connected with and just by chance. A lot of things that happened to me, uh, not only in the past, but right now is in the news every day. So that's another way to get my uh, story out since the uh, media will not, not publicize uh, what I've done, uh, one of the hot items that I stuck with and through was former president's birth certificate. Worked on that for five years. Nobody would touch it. The media would not go near it. What about the birth certificate of Obama? Well, the birth certificate is fake. No doubt about it. But the big question is, why does no one ever cover it? No media, no government. It's like a kiss of death. So that's in my book and a few other things that are happening today with the Russian deal. And I can go on and on. I'm not trying to plug the book. I'm just using that as an example to let you know uh, that uh, what I've gone through in my life. And I think uh, God has something for me because I survived gun battles and you name it. Uh, around the uh, world uh, and survived my 55 years in law enforcement and still alive and kicking. You you survived the fake news. Yeah, that's not the big thing. I survived the cartels trying to kill me and a lot of things. Survived. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I survived, survived all the, uh, all the politics involved in my career. Wow. And it's very interesting when you're high up in the polls, everybody wants your endorsement. Uh, I was a campaign guy for Bush, Mitt Romney, Rick Perry. Well, of course, Donald Trump is my hero. Uh, and I'm with him from day one. I don't flip flop. And when I uh, introduced him July 2015, his first rally happened to be in Phoenix. And nobody would even get up there. I got up there. I introduced him, and I said, you're going to be our next president. I guess I was right. But he has a, he has a warm heart. When I was on trial uh, by a biased federal court in Obama over a misdemeanor, a, a contempt of court, which was nothing, but they made it something. Right. Uh, but when I, my wife used to watch Fox because Donald Trump was on there, so I told Trump, he was a the candidate then, the story that my wife had cancer when she was watching TV to keep, the, uh, keep her mind occupied. I told him the story. He picked up the phone. He called my wife. Now, he didn't have to use my wife to get to me. I was hooked anyway with him. But it wasn't one time call. He's called my wife several times to see how she's doing. Now, all these presidents that I have campaigned and endorsed, they never call. 
but that shows you how the president is. And when I spoke at the national convention, I spoke on prime time just before he did, a couple, a couple of spots before him. And they wanted me to read the speech, teleprompter. I don't read speeches, threw it away. And I said in the five minutes what I felt. And I brought up my wife because the president was taking a lot of heat over women and all that stuff. So that's how I work with Trump. I've talked to him. He knows my number, but I don't go around telling everybody that the president called me. So, uh, so speaking I, of women, um, the nominee that he placed is right now, you know, the hot topic. And even as we speak, the, he, she, they're on live. So what do you think of this nominee? Well, she's got a great record. I never met her. Uh, uh, very conservative. I think she has seven kids. At least she's got a couple adopted kids. Uh, so she has to be a mother, and she's uh, currently a judge and seems like a, a great lady. And uh, I have to praise uh, the president for nominating her, and I hope she gets through. I can't believe anything they can do to go after her. Uh, so other than politics... Her and, religion. And the uh, religion, but I don't think... I don't think all that's going to interfere with her decisions. She's a constitutionalist, and I believe... Knowing her background and knowing her religion, not bringing religion into that, but knowing her background, that, you know, you should be religious, you should not lie, you should be honest. All those traits that follow the Catholic religion will follow her through. It doesn't mean she's going to vote either way, whether you're Catholic or that, but you have to look at the personality of a person a personality, what they really feel. And if she, if she feels that the, uh, the, you should not have any bias when you make rulings or go back and, you know, make decisions on personal feelings and that type of thing. And I believe that she will follow the independence and make the decision to what's right under the Constitution. So... Uh, so I have confidence in her, and I predict she'll be she'll be uh, nominated and appointed. Everybody's saying, why do you wait to after the election? Well, the president has the authority to uh, make that decision, and he did, and it's up to the Senate to follow through. Now, the president pardoned me uh, August 25. Uh, after the hit job they did on me, uh, and he did the right thing. Uh, it was his first pardon. Now, Congratulations. Presidents do pardon people. Uh, uh, I'm not saying he's leaving office, uh, but they do pardon people even at the end of their first term. So what are they going to say? Why did he wait now? Look at all the other presidents, how, how many times they pardoned relatives and everything else. So uh, he's the president. He won, and he has a right to do certain things. And he's taken advantage of that, regardless of the heat that he takes and the heat that I take. And what people ask me all the time, how come you seem to be travel on the same highway than he does. And my response was, most of these politicians, when they want my endorsement, they always say, don't say this because you're going to aggravate the voters or to tell you what to say. He's the first guy that never told me what to say or not to say which made it tough with me because every time I introduced him, I didn't know if I was saying something that would hurt his election. But 95% of what I said, we traveled the same highway together yes. without even talking to each other. So there's something between he and I 
that's a very unusual. Very common, common denominator. It's like both of you like to protect the country. Like you've been fending off the cartel and, uh, you know, just making sure that we're safe. And he wants to do the same thing. But for some reason unknown, he's painted a different picture. But you've been around uh, uh, on this issue, Karen. I'm sure you're dedicated to it. Thank you yes. for speaking out. Because I'll tell you one thing. The power of the media is very, it's very powerful. Yeah. Very powerful. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's good power. Sometimes it's bad power. But it's still out there. Yes. So uh, I have to thank you for spreading the word, too. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a big audience, small audience, it doesn't matter. Even if it's one person, that one person can pass the word. You could say something that really makes a difference with that one person. And that, it's like a disciple, that one person can go out and spread the word. So that's why the media is very important uh, yeah. to everybody. You are very welcome. Word. You are very welcome, and um, I'm th I'm thankful that you like to fight for the truth. And um, like, what's the truth? They're saying they painted you as a racist. Are you a racist? Well, you know, I don't even answer that. I, I laugh at them. Yeah, your grandchildren are different races. Yeah, so, um, yeah, every time they can't get you on something, they throw the race card at you. Yes. And that's what they've been doing with me, especially... The, the hit jobs from the uh, government against me just because I was enforcing a law. Now, I am a nice guy because I've had 2.5 million million people come through me in my jails. Wow. I had the, the big tent city that caused a lot of problems. But what did I do every, every uh, Christmas? I always had the Catholic bishop come out to the tents, say a mass for all these inmates, not 2.5 million at one time. We, we, I used the average about 8,000 a day. Mm -hmm. And then I had a lot of religious people come into the jail, all denominations to talk to the inmates. I've had drug prevention programs. I had all these, but the media will not talk about that. They talk about the hot hot weather, intense, and I took away their meat, took away their TV, took away their porno, took away all that stuff. I took everything away. But that's what they talk about, mm -hmm. how, how evil I am. But I have a reason for doing that. I put the only female chain gang in the history of the world out there. But you know why I do it? And they all volunteer. And I used to send them to bury the deceased at the county cemetery. Of course, if you don't think that made news. But my whole objective is, when they're burying people at the county cemetery, most of them, unfortunately, are Jane Doe's, nobody knows their name, or they're drug users, alcoholism, I can go on and on. But they learn that life is very, very important. So don't go out and do things and you and, and the inmates up and pass it away. So I always have a method to my madness. That's why I put the chain gangs on the main streets. I don't put them out in the desert because when the kid drives by with their parents, I expect the parents to say, hey, Johnny, you see that chain gang with striped uniforms hooked together? Don't you ever do anything wrong. You're going to be on that chain gang. And when, when many people that have served time in the jails, uh, because I had a lot of good uh, pro rehabilitation programs, many of them to this day come up to me and say thank you. If it wasn't for you, I'd still be in jail or I would be dead. And the parents come up to me say thank you. My kid would have died if you did not help them going through the jail system. So I'm rewarded. I don't get much press on that. I think they're going to say nice things about me. But I know what I did. 
And the people know what I did. And so, God knows what you've done. And yeah. look, look, doesn't this just goes, go to prove that um, even though um, your mother delivered you into the world, you didn't really, you didn't have a mother. But your life was so important that now you're standing up on a pillar trying to bring justice to people, trying to bring truth and light to people. And um, that's an example of how each life is so precious and has such purpose by Almighty God. Yeah, I remember the Bible. One thing I always uh, think about is, uh, is uh, what the truth will set you free. So I try to always tell the truth. Of course, sometimes I'm not free because I get so many obstacles in a way to not tell it like it is. Uh, but I know what I'm doing. Right. So that's the main thing. When you go home, you ought to be able to look in the mirror. Or when you read the Bible or go to church, figure, hey, you know, you did what you felt was right. Uh, but um, that's the way it is. My daughter, uh, very religious open up the business high tea called the crown glory and the bishop comes over and while he's there he blesses all the food uh, so i'm very proud of my daughter has written nine books a lot of a lot of the gear from her raising the four adopted kids so i don't want to go too much into the background of the mothers Actually, nobody knows who the fathers are, but I'm not going to get into all that. But she she didn't care. Uh, the one with Down syndrome and the black, she didn't care. She adopted them. I mean, she, she didn't have to adopt them. Mm. But that's the way my daughter is. Yes. I'd love to have her on one day. If she could well, ever I'll, get out of her busy I'll give, life. I'll give, I'll give you a number. I mean, she's, she used to be a reporter. Uh, but uh, I'll give you I'll give her your number. And, yes, and yes, she, yes. She's kind of private in a way. Right. Uh, but she's such a devout Catholic. Right. She would like to, uh, you know. And one reason she, uh, she uh, loves Trump now, not the only reason... But the biggest reason is the right to life issue. Yes. And who knows, if it wasn't for that, she may not be supporting him. Yes. So there's one person who supports the president on that issue because it's a very important issue, one of the most important issues we have. Right. How can you allow, like, I think it was Biden or something, to abort babies is just ready to be born. If I'm correct on that, am I right on that? It's terrible. It's well, terrible. How can you do that? Yeah, they that's all like, across the board. They all agree to that, and they say that it's their the mother's choice. But this is a life, you know. It, you're saying you have a choice to kill. So anybody has a choice to go out there and have a gun and kill anybody. It's the same thing. Now we have all this high tech the equipment. You can see the baby moving around. My, my mother died. We didn't have all that. But how can you look at the baby and then kill the baby at the end? How can you do that? It's hardness of heart. I mean, think of that. You can see the baby. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So what do you think of these people who say that they're practicing Catholics, but they believe in abortion, even up to the last day and even out of, well, they can't do it anymore out of the womb because Trump made an executive order recently that they, they receive care. They used to leave them to die as they were born in a botched abortion. This is really disgusting. Yeah, we're living in a tough, uh, tough country, a tough world these days, and uh, it's unfortunate. And uh, so, you know, I guess my mother, 
uh, could have said, you know, well, you know, she was very sick and and uh, abort, have the abortion, uh, which would put it in a little different light way back, uh, but she refused to have an abortion. Right. And, and unfortunately, she passed away. So anyway, I turned out okay. Yes, you did. Congratulations. And We're glad father, to have you. Yeah, my father was a great person. He came over from the old country and opened up some Italian stores. And all this was concerned when I joined the Army. They got really concerned when he read in a paper my gun battles uh, in Turkey that made the local paper when I was overseas. I've been through a lot, uh, but that's okay. But he died at 74 uh, with cancer. Now, I'm still going strong. How old are I you, mean, Sheriff Joe? Well, everybody thinks I'm 60, but they forgot. Uh, that's 28 years are wrong because I'm <laughs> 88. Wow. And I work 14 hours a day. I ran for office. I got beat uh, just barely last month. But I think my age had a lot to do with it, even though I was out there campaigning at 116 degrees. And uh, But I just narrowly lost. But that's okay. I got other plans. I'm staying active. And I always give my age because I want the older people to know there's still life. And look at me. I was 60 when I ran for sheriff. Wow. 60. And I lasted... That's an awesome. 24 years. Wow. And, uh, and I ran again. And I used my age. So I want all the older people to know there's another life, too, other than playing golf or watching TV. Get out there and work. Use me as an example. So I tell everybody to mention my age. I'm not ashamed. I'll outgun anybody anyway. So what's the age got to do with it? It just shows how much uh, potential you could do and affect in people's life. You know? And that's a good point, Karen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I'll tell you why. Uh, when I joined the Army, uh, I, as I told you, I used to go to, you know, Passaic and all that. And then when I got out, I went to school, uh, criminology school in New York. But then I became a cop, and I was so busy arresting people, going to court, I never did complete my degree. So you're talking to one guy that doesn't have all these degrees, but I don't need it. Not everybody should have a degree now because it's like a high school degree now. Uh, uh, you know, everybody has it for their record. doesn't mean they're going to get jobs. But the point I'm saying, I survived on two things. Well, they're religious. And then I survived on common sense hmm. and life experience. That's in the drive to do. I don't want to plug myself. But I still, I think my book will do that. Yes. But, but I, not that I have somebody, a lot of people call me a hero and you're the greatest. And my answer always is, I'm just using common sense. But you have to have a desire. Never surrender. Never surrender. Amen. My, my favorite song, and my wife doesn't like the opening of the song. But I love that song. And in fact, I sang it a couple of times on national TV, which was stupid because I can't sing. <laughs> it's called, it's my, one of my favorite singers that comes, that comes from your area, uh -huh. Italian. First name is Frank. Oh, so, Blue Eyes. You know, I thought he's, he's from your area. Yes. Right? Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. And that's my way. Yeah. My way. So it starts off, unfortunately, and now the end is near. So she looks at that, wow. But when all the media, when they come to me, 
And they say, hey, Sheriff, you got any regrets? And I swing back and I say, I'll tell you the lyrics, Frank Sinatra, my way. Regrets, regrets I've had a few, but too few to mention. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's what I tell all these <laughs> media. Right. But that is my favorite song, and I just happen to remember that he's from your area down there. Yep, Hoboken. So Jersey and New York, critical states. Yes. I, I was just in uh, a few months ago. I was uh, in Patterson talking to a thousand police officers. Great. And uh, and I'm a big supporter of law enforcement. Yes. Uh, I don't I don't like what they're doing to law enforcement using a racial situation. They say uh, we have to back up our cops. And uh, I kind of like the cops from the older days. They police a little different in those days which includes me because I walked a black beat for four years in Washington, D.C. And that was a tough beat, tough city, still tough today. But uh, so and then being a federal guy for 27 years. And uh, so I lived through all this. I survived. And I always put, I hate to say this, got to be honest, I've always put the job before my family in my in my career. Fortunately, I have a wife of sixty going on sixty three years that has traveled everywhere with me, Turkey, Mexico, all over the country, and she had to live through all my law enforcement experiences. Uh, so, but she was standing right next to me, and during my elections, she was always there. Mm. So naturally, I dedicate my third book to her, and my family. Mm. But, but she saved my life. Oh. I don't know. I, I don't know if you have time to listen to this, but go ahead. Sure, she, sure. She, she saved my life in Turkey. They, they, they brought they sent me to Turkey by myself without my son Rocco and uh, who was two years old and my wife they finally sent both of them over to join me I had a big deal going uh, from Istanbul negotiating with a big dope peddler in Beirut Lebanon and I was supposed to be there that night and the first time I ever ever halted an investigation. But I did this time to meet my wife coming in at the airport. The cops, everybody was there with flowers. And guess what? Mm -hmm. There's only one plane from Istanbul to Beirut. I was supposed to be on that plane, but that crashed and killed everybody. The next oh. day, I'm on a, not that plane, another one, and I'm looking down at all the records. records. So if I did not, go to the airport and just let my wife come in and everybody else meet with her, I would have been dead. Yeah. And I'm not going into all the gun battles I've had survive. So I